hosted the TIBCO Analytics Meetup, July 2019, with the TIBCO Data Science team. There's some information in here that uh, is confidential, but please uh, take it as it is. Uh, TIBCO Analytics Meetup is a group, is a real opportunity to uh, learn and network with uh, colleagues. Uh, so please join the meetup group. You'll get notifications of, uh, of new uh, meetups. You'll get links to the community site with slides and demos from uh, each individual meetup, including uh, today. And today's schedule is uh, pretty awesome. We've got uh, an update on our uh, automated machine learning, AutoML, from, uh, from Dan Rope, um, and the Spotify data function for, uh, that's linked with that. Uh, we have an image recognition demonstration by Colin Gray. Uh, calling out from Spotify with the Python data function into the uh, AWS uh, SDK uh, for uh, invoking uh, libraries for doing image recognition and going back and forth between uh, Spotify and those, uh, those libraries. And then we'll wrap up with a community update from Helene Stelting. Please submit your questions at any time uh, via the Q&A option and we'll answer those at the end or we'll get back to you uh, on email. So in terms of an update from the analytics and data science team at TIPCO, uh, just a quick uh, calibration on the, uh, on the portfolio. Uh, there's three aspects to the TIPCO portfolio. At the top there, the, uh, the augment uh, components, analytics, data science, visual analytics. Uh, on the right, uh, the unify component uh, of, of products um, for master data management, as well as data virtualization, data governance, cataloging. And then the connect piece, API-led uh, microservices integration and event-driven uh, applications. So we'll be focused on the top, the orange part here, the augment part of the portfolio today. Uh, and the portfolio comes together with uh, data science and reporting and visual analytics across the top, as you see here. Um, and then uh, uh, data operations, information management, event processing integration going down, uh, down the stack. So we'll be focused in the top row and in particular, will be focused on Spotfire and the new analytics experience launched in Spotfire 10. Uh, lots of accolades for this product from analysts. We just won Cody Award for uh, best interactive BI and analytics platform. Uh, and we've two big areas of uh, innovation here. Top left here, this uh, AI powered insights, we've included a, an AI engine into the product. So as you point Spotfire at, uh, at data, it automatically finds patterns in the data. It presents those to you in order of uh, relationship strength. As you click around, it updates those recommendations uh, to you. Uh, even includes the ability to uh, interactively explore and, and get uh, recommendations in that setting. Um, it also includes a natural language query interface. So you can query the data, ask questions about the patterns in the data. Those are again presented to you in order of the relationship strength in the most appropriate uh, visual uh, analytic thumbnails uh, and you can also have a conversation with Spotfire about how to do things in the product uh, and get quick uh, one-click links into doing various operations. So a bit of a sea change in the interface, uh, broadening the, uh, the usability of Spotfire to very casual users who've never used the product before uh, all the way to uh, deep users. And then bottom right here we've added um, uh, the ability to look at um, data streams. So in addition to querying and visualizing uh, data at rest, you can also incorporate data on an event stream such as a Kafka stream or MQTT or a variety of uh, um, industry related uh, event stream uh, interfaces to IoT technologies, financial services, things like that. So combining uh, uh, moving data with uh, data at rest uh, and the same brush linking and all the same operations in Spotfire still work exactly the same um, in incorporating both data at rest and, and data in motion together in one uh, experience. Uh, top right, we've also continued to add to the uh, uh, automated tracking and lineage of uh, all your point and click and, and scripting operations and provided a data, an entry point to continue to uh, evolve those. So since we spoke, last spoke to you folks, we've been very busy. Uh, we did our Tipco Now Chicago event here on the left. Um, sold out event, lots of activity there uh, in Chicago. We were also then in Denver uh, for the energy sector uh, OTEC conference. I'll be showing some highlights of that. And then we're out um, in Semicon West for presenting our digital twin for manufacturing yield uh, in, uh, in, in San Francisco. Uh, 
So we've been uh, around the US and we're on our way, uh, you know, on our way to, to uh, London. Uh, Tipco Now London is coming soon, uh, coming right up in, uh, uh, in September. And then in October, we've got the Tipco Analytics Forum in, uh, in Houston. And we've broadened this out. This has a massive appeal to the, the big uh, community of Spotify users in Houston in the energy sector. But this year, we've broadened that out to, uh, to other industry sectors and uh, appealing to all the Tipco, uh, Spotify, and analytics folks from, uh, from across the United States to, to come to that event. So two big events in September and October, uh, one in Europe and one in, uh, one in the US. So I uh, wanted to give you a brief preview of what we've been doing at the Eurotech conference. Uh, we got a lot of data from uh, our partnership with IHS and uh, looked at um, multivariate seismic data, did a, uh, a deep learning, uh, artificial neural network, uh, self-organizing map analysis to organize those multiple dimensions and give a, a, a topological view onto that multivariate space that allowed you to navigate from that representation into this lat long representation uh, to find uh, you know, defaults and uh, areas of opportunity, uh, cracks and so on in the geology. Uh, so being able to navigate that in terms of the seismic variables allows uh, folks to do reservoir engineering and planning uh, you know, at that level. Uh, we also looked at uh, well spacing data. So this is satellite imagery along with uh, 3D viewing of, uh, of current well trajectories to look for opportunities for uh, expanding the drilling operation. Um, and then looking uh, on top of that, those existing well locations at uh, petrophysical data, for example, total organic carbon that shows areas of opportunity, lower left um, on the left-hand graph shows a, a, a hotspots of total organic carbon. And so when you overlay those petrophysical parameters on top of the well, uh, current well spacing uh, parameters, you then get some uh, uh, you identify some hotspots as to where uh, opportunities exist for, uh, you know, for additional drilling. So pretty exciting analysis uh, anchored by uh, advanced geoanalytics. That's easy to do in uh, Spotfire, uh, along with calling into uh, uh, neural net uh, deep learning self-organizing maps for uh, navigating multi-dimensions on a visual, uh, visual canvas. So when you overlay those two things together, you see the bottom left here is the region the orange region with, the, with no black is, uh, is an area of opportunity. So taking into account um, outside of each of the uh, current drills, the uh, uh, reservoir basin that that, uh, drilling, that, that drill path is, uh, is clearing and then providing the uh, orange color around that as an area of opportunity. Uh, but really combining those uh, analyses gives some really deep insights into a high dimensional multivariate set of data uh, combined with um, physical um, drilling data to, to get the sweet spot for, for going forward. So that's just a brief uh, preview of some of the work we've been doing. A lot of exciting stuff. Tipco uh, Spotfire 10 really opens up uh, uh, a wide canvas of, uh, of opportunities, both within the product and through the uh, external uh, touch points. And we're going to show you today a couple of uh, innovative areas of work. One, uh, AutoML and Tipco Data Science for automating the process of feature engineering and machine learning. And then Spotfire plus uh, the, the Boto3 SDK available you know, through the Spotfire Python uh, data function for calling into AWS for doing things like image recognition, uh, text and, uh, and voice recognition and so on. So uh, that uh, is, is basically a setup for uh, uh, the second part of the presentation. We're doing a lot with the cloud vendors, uh, connecting to uh, data sources, uh, enabling uh, both our data science and visual analytics operations through our Python interfaces, like our Python notebook is part of our Tipco data science offering, our Python data function is part of Tipco Spotfire, calling into the AWS libraries in this case, and uh, pushing out those results for operational systems. So with that, uh, let me hand off to uh, Dan to uh, talk to us about AutoML. Dan? All right, sounds great. So, should, okay, I'll share. Okay. All right. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so hi, hi everyone. Uh, Dan Rope here on the Tipco Data Science team. I'm going to talk to you about a couple things today. One is uh, AutoML, and secondly, a data function for the Team Studio product in Tipco Data Science. Both of these are actually available on the community exchange as components that we've done as extensions uh, for those products. 
So the first one I'm going to go in a bit more depth in is, oops, is the uh, is AutoML. So let's let's talk about AutoML first. So first of all, what is AutoML? Uh, essentially, what it is is the automation and optimization of common steps that are used to train up a machine learning model. And so there's a lot of benefits for that. And we think that you know from our point of view, there's benefits both to a data scientist and also to a citizen data scientist. For a data scientist, you know, sometimes it can just be a lot more productive, a lot faster to get started if you've got something on the screen to then edit, as opposed to starting from a blank canvas. And so that can really improves productivity by automating some of these common steps as well. And oftentimes there's a lot of like, you know, grunge work, if you will, that need to be done. And so having that, that part of it done for you uh, can really speed the process up a bit. It also allows you to try maybe some feature engineering techniques that you haven't checked out yet or some different algorithms and so forth. It gives you a chance to easily uh, you know, pursue those. For a citizen data scientist, really what it does, it kind of helps you really get started a lot faster with these things, with feature engineering and, and machine learning a lot faster. And the way we've done it, we feel, is it gives you some guidance on some practice. We're building into our techniques and how we do it, and you can sort of learn from that and observe how that process actually happens and then learn a little bit more about the details of a machine learning process. It allows you to actually rapidly try out different models as well. So you can try different things really quickly, just try different models, see how well they're doing, and quickly see what, uh, you know, where, where you might be locking onto something that, that could be valuable. And so that allows you to quickly explore a, a wider range of, of use cases as well. So what we view AutoML actually is down to the characteristics of the algorithm itself. So we, there's three main characteristics. One is it automatically generates features from the data using techniques that are commonly used by data scientists. So that'll generate transformations of data that are fed into those predictive models. Secondly, it automatically selects a, set, a candidate set of predictors for your target variable for you. And then finally, it automatically executes across a wide variety of algorithms, each of which has a different set of parameters, ultimately coming across, a, ultimately training up several models from which we pick an overall winner that you can then use and deploy, the best performing model, if you will. So the goals of this project that we've been working on is first of all, transparency. So we wanna provide visibility into the process, something that you can inspect and interrogate and see what actually happened. That allows you to not, not only learn, but also modify it as well to suit your needs. So you can actually edit what was done by our automated processes. And so we feel that can open up a collaboration across an expert data scientist and a citizen data scientist working together to, to achieve the goal of coming up with a, a good model. Second is scalability. So we're building on top of our Team Studio product and that's been designed from the ground up, as, as most people know, to, be, to work in cluster, in database, you know, across Spark and so forth and at scale. And so we feel starting with a framework like that makes a lot of sense for something like AutoML because you can imagine there's a lot of different routines and all these things happening in parallel. We gain a lot of efficiencies by having a platform that's designed for that. And then ultimately where we wanna go is, is add an ability to understand these models as well. So visual explanations, um, interpretability, like did this model actually lock onto something that I'm expecting it to? You know, what's, what's the explainability? How do I understand the characteristics, the behaviors of what it's actually predicting? So that's something for the future for us. So what we have is for, that's available today is we're starting with a foundation. So the nice thing about the Team Studio product is it's very extensible. And so we've, we've taken advantage of that fact to be able to add in these new features. So we've added things, we use uh, existing things like feature engineering that's, that's already in the product, but we also added some new ones as well. And those are available for use in AutoML, but also you can just use them directly if you want to. So we've added in feature engineering, we've added in some techniques for variable selection and as well, and also the automated model selection. So those are all new operators that we've included in our AutoML package. But then around that, we've got another operator that actually orchestrates that entire process. So it'll actually analyze the data and assemble these workflows for you, ready to run. And so that workflow is fully parameterized. You really just need to, to uh, pick a target variable and, and go. So the main differentiation we feel here is that this is a really, we've been calling this kind of a Lego blocks approach versus black box. You can actually see the pieces that go into the process and you can actually look at them and adjust them as well. So it leads to an editable workflow that you can refine and optimize uh, for your needs. And of course, everything is running at scale and in database. So I'm gonna give you a quick demo here of what it looks like. So the first thing I'll start off for contrast here is this is 
manual ML, if you will. So this is a workflow in the Team Studio product for addressing a machine learning pro problem. In this case, we're trying to predict whether or not uh, a case, a fraudulent transaction has happened in, for an insurance data set. So typically we start off here where we got our fraud data set, our cases for fraud, we've got our customer database, we wanna combine those. And then we feel that income is gonna be something important. So we're gonna join that in there as well by using zip code as, a, as kind of a proxy. And then you can see we kind of start the process here. Where we start determining like what are, what are ways to transform those variables so we can have better predictive power out of those for our model. And so we have a few steps that we do that. We bucket categorical variables. We, you know, we do things like we normalize the, the features. Um, we get rid of no value, uh, some no value replacement doing imputation and so forth to get to the data set that we want to use to do our, pr our predictions for a target variable. Then we do a train test split. So we have that holdout data set so we can evaluate our model. And we train up over, under a number of different algorithms. And finally, we compare all those to get an overall result. And we can see, you know, in this case here, you know, as a confusion matrix for each one of these models, we see we got up a, about an 81% model for the one that was determined manually here to be the best. Okay, so that, that, that's a, a manual process approach to, uh, to, to machine learning, something that's been supported in the product, you know, for, for forever, really. Contrast that to our automated machine learning, or AutoML. We still, of course, want to join the data sets that we think are relevant for doing our predictions. But here, we have an orchestrator node that's actually going to perform the predictions for us. So we just drag this node into the canvas, hook it up to our data set. And then all we really need to do is select the column in that data set, in this case, whether a transaction was fraudulent or not, that we actually want to build a predictive model for. That's really all you need to do, and then you can run it, and it'll build those models for you. There's another parameter here as well, which you can adjust. And this is essentially a, a, a model performance versus a speed of computation trade-off. So we'll adjust the parameters so we can get a quicker model that might not be as good if you wanna get something quick versus a, a deeper model that might take a longer time, but give you more accuracy. So when you run that, it, you know, it could take me about 25, 30 minutes, depending on the size of the data set. It could take longer than that. Um, and when it's done, what you see on the bottom is the results. So these are sort of a tab set of results here that says the results of what happened. And so one of the things that's probably most interesting to look at is the leaderboard. So you can see there's several models where we're actually built here and the one on top here has the metrics here that have the overall top accuracy. So around 77, 78% here. So it's getting kind of close to our, our, the one that was done in, in, in the manual uh, process. You can also look at the information about the top model. You can see what were the variables that were used, what were the parameters that were used for that specific model. And then you can also look at the variable importances. So for the, the top variables that were important for that, for that prediction, you can see what those variables were. And you can tell by the names a little bit here and what the transformations that were actually done to those variables to, 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 to result in that model. Now, how did this actually happen? So what happened was behind the scenes, is this actually generated several workflows on your behalf and then executed those to come up with the overall winning model strategy. And so I can show you some of those workflows here. So these, all of these, these were not created by a person. These were created by the machine, if you will. Um, but I'll just kind of give you a quick sense as to what each one of them does. So first off, we have a bit here on, on data preparation and cleaning. So we've taken the liberty to go through some of the variables and, and take care of some common issues with data prep and cleaning to make sure the values are going to be uh, able to be processed uh, by the process. Um, we, we look at the, the target variable, ensure that it's, it's encoded properly, um, and do some null value uh, uh, imput imputation on missing values and so forth on the data itself. And then we also do the train test split for value, the train test split for you, and then also we get some metrics off of that training set that we're going to use to determine future some of these uh, subsequent flows. So if we go into the feature engineering flow here, and I'll open this one up. So in this case here, we've got our training set, we've got our testing set coming down in the pipeline. And on the training set, we're going to you know, determine what are the variables that actually be useful for prediction. So something like an entirely all the same value for a column, that's useless. We're gonna to toss that one out. We're gonna do some imputation on the missing data for the predictors, normalization, and other feature engineering as well. These robot icons, these are the ones that we've added as part of as AutoML as new feature engineering techniques that you can use either on your own or they're used also in the AutoML process. Generally, they, they are for dealing with categorical variables. So these are ways of transforming categorical variables into numeric values to increase the predictive power ultimately downstream uh, in the modeling technique. Now, we also have 
rules that are done behind the scenes as part of the process to determine what the feature engineering strategy should be. And so there's, these are based on things like the distribution of the, of the categories, based on things like um, uh, also the cardinality, like how many unique values and so forth. And in t sometimes there's, there's clear things to do and sometimes there's, there's not. When there's clear things to do, we'll arrange the nodes automatically for you. When there's not, we'll actually do different strategies and allow the modeling to sort of sort it out down, downstream in the process. So that's why you see these different feature engineering strategies here as well. So the next step is feature selection. And for this, again, we've added um, stability selection as a technique that you can, again, use on your own or as part of the AutoML process. And essentially what this is doing is there are some modeling techniques built into these nodes that take subsets of the data and we chose models that, are, that specifically turn out some variable importances. And so we use the results of those variable importances for the subsets of the data to recommend candidate variables for prediction for the models that will ultimately be training in the next step. And then finally, the modeling step itself. So here we now we collect all of those feature engineering strategies, all of those candidate variables we want to use for predictions, and we run those across all of the candidate algorithms that we're going to use to train up models. So in this case, we have a random forest, we have gradient boosted trees, and a logistic regression. Now each one of those is not just one model, they run across a, a span of parameters, hyperparameters, if you will, to, uh, to produce several models, each of which is evaluated against that holdout data set. And then for each one of those, we actually do retain the winning model for each one of those, which you can use. If you, so if, you want to use, if you don't want to use the one that we found to be the overall winner, winner, you can go find the one that was actually one of these other ones as well. So those are actually also retained. And then finally, we do an ultimate overall comparison across every algorithm, across every model that was generated to come up with that leaderboard that I was showing earlier um, in, in, the, in the results. And so what that is, is that's what this, these algorithms are saying, like this is like the best model that I can actually produce for you. You know, I've tried all these feature engineering techniques, these different algorithms. This is the best predictive model for that data and that target variable. So, um, okay, so the um, last thing I'll say is now, if sometimes you might actually wanna modify that process. So if we look at the, you know, the results of our, of our original model, you might detect, you know, there's a fraud case, it might be some imbalance. And so, so maybe, you know, you might want to take some adjustment techniques to actually, you know, resample some of that data uh, so that you've got a more, a more even distribution. Um, you can actually do that by actually going into the, oops, sorry, it's this one here. Oh, no, this one here. You can actually go into the flows that were generated themselves. And in here, I've actually upsampled the data to try to correct some of that imbalance for the target. So, you know, fraud is a rare case. So we want to upsample so we have a more even distribution and then send that down to the rest of the models as well. And so you can actually edit that flow and then you can go back and just rerun from here. And then when that completes, you can see your results and go back to the leaderboard and compare. And then you may not remember from the last time, but essentially we've got a little bit, some, other, other, some of these other metrics here that are, are looking at those kinds of issues are, are a bit improved by, by taking that action. So again, the main point is here, these are, um, it's an orchestrator for AutoML, automatically generating workflows for you. Um, it allows you to then modify those to adjust them to your needs and ultimately get the model that you might want to get for deployment. Okay. Okay, so that is essentially uh, what we have for AutoML. Um, I, I think I forgot to mention before, with this also being done through the TIPCO Labs program. This is a, an innovation program that we engage with customers on projects like this. So you can become involved and you can help us work more towards like what, you know, what the future of this can be. So, you know, we, we, you know, that's opened up to, you know, certain customers to help us sort of guide the future in this. Okay, I also want to mention the on a different topic, this is a new data function that we've built for the, the and put on the component exchange for Team Studio. Uh, essentially, what it is is it's, a, it's those of you that use Spotfire know what a data function is. This is a data function for using the Team Studio product. Team Studio is the product that I was showing for AutoML. This is a data function you can use from Spotfire to run your workflows in Team Studio. 
and it does support customization of those workflows. Team Studio can expose workflow parameters and you can control those from, um, from, your, from Spotfire and specify what those, those values are. And essentially the way this has worked, this is designed for kind of a big data problem. So both Spotfire uses its big data features talking to remotely to like a large data source and Team Studio does as well. And so Team Studio processes the data and then Spotfire is executing remote calls to get aggregations and so forth for your visualizations. And importantly, this supports long running workflow executions. This is big data after all, it could take a long time. You might set something off and go to lunch and come back. You can even shut down Spotfire, uh, come back, fire Spotfire up and it'll pick up right where you left off and notify when these workflows have completed and populate those visualizations. You can, you can do your visualizations from directly from the source and you can also take some of the results that are done in Team Studio and bring those as data tables directly into Spotfire that you can use for your visualizations. And again, this is available today on the TIPCO Community Exchange. And uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll turn over to uh, Colin. And we'll talk about uh, image recognition. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I'm going to talk about doing image recognition with Spotfire. Um, as Michael mentioned at the start, this is going to be using Python with uh, AWS. Um, so, just a little introduction into image recognition. Um, you know, image recognition is the ability to scan, you know, photographs, images, um, even videos to try and detect labels, objects, etc. Um, automatically. You know, it's got a lot of potential use cases to do this. You know, you could be uh, the medical industry to scan, you know, medical imagery looking for potential illnesses early. Um, you know, security intelligence looking for identification of people. Uh, even in manufacturing, you know, looking at products produced as of high quality, you can detect that through images. And, and finally, in the environment, you can even use satellite imagery to detect pollutants, um, use of agriculture, etc. So it's got huge potential and has been used in a lot of industries. So what I wanted to do was actually experiment with could we utilize image recognition with Spotfire to provide a very visual interactive way of running image recognition. So what I wanted to do at the same time, I had been at an AWS and Amazon conference where they were talking about the recognize um, service they have, which is image recognition and video image recognition. And they gave some really interesting examples, look like a charity in America using it to identify missing people um, and try and locate them and things like that. So I thought, why don't we try and connect Spotfire to AWS to actually perform some image recognition. But it doesn't, you can see here that most of the big players have actually got image recognition or, or forms of it available as well. And I'll mention at the end and talk a, bit, a little bit about this, but the reason I'm using Amazon is to test a pre-built model, but of course you could build your own model in SageMaker or Team Studio as we've just seen um, with Dan uh, to do this. So I'm actually going to jump out to Spotfire just now and hopefully give you a live demonstration of image recognition. So I have a directory here of some photographs that I took. And what I'm going to do is paste that directory into Spotfire and I'm just going to hit scan. And what Spotfire has done is using R and Python, it's actually scanned that directory, um, read all the images, extracted metadata. So you can see here the size when it was taken, it's displaying the image. It also displays it on a map, so we can extract location, geolocation data about um, each image. So here you can see the various places this was taken, um, tracking my movement <laughs> in the last month or so. Now what we want to do is actually pass these images straight into Amazon to actually identify labels. So I'm going to click on this image, and it's live sending this up to AWS right now. So it'll just take a second or two, you saw that that was pretty fast. And what it's done is it's returned the analysis from Amazon's recognized service. And here's the output that was provided to Spotfire. So this has all been done via a Python data function using Amazon's Boto3 library. And I'll, I'll show that in a little bit more detail later. But here you can see the results. It's identified different labels. Um, it gives you the confidence that it thinks that identification has. Is it high or low confidence? It gives you some parent sort of descriptions of what that type of thing is. 
And then it tells you a number, how many of these did it find and whether there's bounding boxes present. So for instance, it says there's nine people in this picture. So what we've done in Spotfire is we've made this interactive. So if I click on that, you can now see that each person it's identified, there is now a bounding box drawn on that image so that you can see where it's put up the people. And here you can see a bit more detail of the nine people, what confidence they are. So for example, if I want to see person two, where they're very confident, or there's a person here that they're low confidence, you can assess how good those confidence uh, um, levels are. You can see that sometimes it gets it a bit wrong, so that it's identified a pool table that is here, but it also thinks it could be a train or possibly a jacuzzi. So it just shows that, you know, the generic model, you have to be careful with, you know, uh, and train it to do the things you want to do before production use. But you can see how interactive and easy this is. I can click between any image. Um, it spawns each job to Amazon and instantly returns back. It plots it on the map. Here I've got more people identified, a train. So it's very visual, very interactive, um, and gives you real scope to actually play around with a model to produce this. And this was all done through a mixture of ARM Python, the Python data function, and a little bit of JavaScript here to make it control some of the activity. So I wanted to explore doing this in other ways, how look at other use cases. Um, so for instance, I wanted to um, scan uh, a live feed. So for this, I was using a website, um, which I should have available to show, um, which was explore.org. And that has live feeds from um, Wilderness. So it's got a, a video feed that's running constantly, um, for instance, in Alaska at the Katmai River where, where brown bears feed. Um, so what I wanted to do was capture imagery from a live feed and see if we could scan that also in Spotfire. So what we've got here is this is the date of the day of the month, and this is the hour along here. And this is the number of each thing it identifies. So you can see at this time, 7 a.m., there was 18 birds, five bears. So what we can do is then just click on this, and it actually shows you all the imagery that I captured from this live feed. And it shows you the bears that I identified. So if you click on the bird, for instance, it's identified birds in all these pictures. You can see all the birds around here. So this was a nice example. Imagine if you had a, a streaming feed of images that you could sort of build this idea of when do things appear? When do they, where are they more prevalent? You can even get individual confidences here. You know, this, there's a confidence here that this photo contains a bear, which it does. Um, and you can click through these. So again, very interactive and very quick. You can also see the problem with some of these models. Again, they're very generic, so you might want to train your own. It thinks there's an elephant in one of these pictures. It thinks there's a penguin, possibly that there. It thinks a penguin, even a person. So it's good, good practice, again, to sort of analyze what comes out and, and assess your model. So what I'll do now is I'll just skip back to the first demo, and I'll show you a little bit about how this works and how we implemented this in Spotfire. So there's uh, a few key components um, that are in this. The first one is how to read the information into Spotfire. So what I've done here is I've used an ARM Python script. So in Spotfire, you can hook up a script um, that runs when you need it to. So I've got a script called read images. Uh, I won't go through in complete detail, but it's just to show the potential for this. Because Spotfire has ARM Python, which gives you access not only to Spotfire's own API, it gives you access to system APIs, so C-sharp APIs. You can do lots of interesting things with files and systems and building tables. So what this function actually does is here, it's effectively taking the path that I put in here, and it's then looping over the files. So this section here loops over all the files and does a lot of things such as taking out the source image, picking out latitude, um, the image size, etc., and then builds that all as a table to return back to Spotfire. And here I'm using a function in ARM Python again that strips out things like the date and latitude, so the, the information metadata. So that makes it really easy to bring out all this detail and show it in Spotfire. The second stage is obviously sending your image then to Amazon service. So for that, what we can do is use a data function. 
Uh, data functions in Spotfire can call out to R, it can call out to Ter, which is Spotfire's own enterprise R, it can call out to other things like MATLAB. But one of the nice new additions uh, not that long ago was the ability to call it to Python. So that opens up a massive potential for machine learning in Spotfire. So here I've got an image recognition script, and I'll just show you how simple that is. So this is a script. Um, I'm using a few standard libraries. Um, Botl3 is the crucial one. That's Amazon's own library to call out to their services. And it opens up massive potential. You can do SageMaker, you can do S3, all these things. And the code is quite simple. Um, what all it's doing here is looping over each image that's been passed. It's then setting us to say we want to use the recognition service from Amazon. And then the last bit of code it needs is it's just detect labels as the function in Amazon, and we're just passing it this image. So really simple, all those lines of code sends each image, uh, we click on and automatically does image recognition. The rest of the script is actually just formatting, handling the JSON object. So it's just flattening out the different pieces of information, you know, to pass back to Spotfire to give us the interactivity we want. So for instance, here we're dragging out coordinates so that we could draw those bounding boxes um, and then pass that back. And that's where you see this interactivity. So that bounding box is passed back as a table. So, the one other thing I wanted to add to this demo, um, which I only implemented um, in the last day, so I hope it works, was the idea that not only could you scan local files, but you could also scan potentially something from an S3 bucket. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reopen this tool. And this time I'm going to say I want to get it straight from S3. S3 is um, you know, Amazon's simple storage system where you can store files and data, etc. So when I click that, this should go out to Amazon. So there you can see that spinning, hopefully. And that's actually retrieving live my S3 bucket called Spotfire Demo Images, and it's downloaded all the images now into Spotfire, and I can then do the same scanning. So the exact same experience as before, but this time I didn't need my files locally. I actually called out to an S3 bucket on Amazon storage. So I hope that gives you some flavor of what can be done with Amazon uh, and Spotfire and the way that you can use all of the functionality to produce image recognition and show you the potential for that. And um, so I'll just flip back to my uh, presentation and hand over to Helene. Wonderful, thank you. So let me share my screen. Okay, great. It's time for a community update. Um, and I typically, um, at this part of the Tipco Analytics Meetup, give an overview of the various uh, topics that are um, uh, available on the community for you to download and to look at. Um, so there's a, there's a number of um, items here that I wanted to uh, present, I'm sorry. Um, and I also wanted to um, make it uh, clear for everyone that the Tipco community is a bit broader than just the, um, the normal community.tipco.com. Uh, there are several ways that you can interact with us and also get updates, um, depending a little bit, I guess, on your personal uh, preference. What I wanted to, uh, to um, uh, explain to you is that we have also created a customer success group on LinkedIn for Spotfire. So I'd really uh, invite all of you to, um, uh, to join this group. Um, this is a way to just get updates on new uh, videos that are being posted or new information that's there, um, including uh, the Tipco Analytics Meetup today. Um, you can also get the information by joining the meetup, but I think this is quite a complete um, way of being informed if you're frequently on LinkedIn and, uh, and if you're using Spotfire. Um, but there are also other groups uh, on Reddit and Facebook as well. So um, after this event, we'll be sharing all of these uh, slides and links with you. So, uh, so feel free to join one of these groups to be uh, fully informed. Um, and the other thing I also wanted to um, uh, point out to you is that uh, we're quite active on the YouTube channel. Um, what's important is that you sub uh, subscribe to the specific channel uh, that you're interested in so that you get uh, updates when a new video is posted. So recently we've been posting, posting quite a few videos on Spotfire tips and tricks. So, um, so those are available on YouTube and the links to the specific uh, channels are here. 
So um, let's go to the, uh, the actual community for a live demo and what you can find here. So uh, for some of you who may not have been on the community for a little while, uh, the look and feel has changed a little bit. So let me just remind you of the um, sort of the most important parts of the community. Um, I'm just going to move my bar down a little bit. So um, the answer section is really important. Um, we're actually in this right now. Um, this is where you can ask questions and get answers. Um, a lot of people make use of this and the wider community, uh, you all users, um, the data science team, the TIPCO support team, they all help answer uh, questions here. Um, and if you search for a specific uh, question or a, a specific topic, you'll actually get a lot of um, uh, examples of questions that have already been answered. So as you can see here, there's a total of 40,000 questions that have been answered in the past. Uh, almost 16,000 of those are related to Spotfire. Um, so, um, and, and you know, 1,400 now on data science as well. So there's, there's a, probably a chance that somebody has asked your question already. So I really encourage you to, uh, to take advantage of this knowledge base and contribute to it as well. If you have a question you can answer, um, please use that as well. The other important part of the TIPCO community is the exchange. So we presented a number of uh, extensions uh, and data functions today uh, to you. And they're all available to download with all the relevant information uh, on the TIPCO Community Exchange. Um, for example, here, if you click on Advanced Analytics, uh, you'll be able to see the uh, AutoML functionality that uh, Dan presented. If you scroll down a little bit, um, you can see the uh, data function for TIPCO Data Science to Team Studio that Dan uh, presented as well. So that's all available there. Um, I was looking for the Python one as well. So if I just search for the modules, the search works pretty well on the community. Um, if you can't find something straight away, there's a lot of information on there. Sometimes you just have to, I'm oh, sorry, have to unclick the filters. Um, so for, um, if I search for Python, um, I should get an exchange item actually. I don't see it at the moment. Um, but it was there earlier. <laughs> so anyway, I'll, I'll share the link for that. There's a, the Python data function is available on the exchange as well for you. Um, and then actually it's right here, the custom data function for TIPCO Spotfire to execute Python code. So it's there. Um, and then um, the other thing I wanted to show to you is um, we, we have sort of summarized a lot of information to help you on board uh, with Spotfire also to help you develop your Spotfire skills um, on Spotfire. Um, so a lot of the links that I just showed and a lot of the information that you learn in these webinars are cross-linked uh, from various places in the typical community. And I think you just have to find sort of your, your main page that, you, um, uh, that sort of suits your skill set and, and your develop, development needs most. Um, so this one is the, what we call the customer orientation uh, uh, place where we send people to when they're new to Spotfire. Uh, but as you can see, um, it, it allows you to sort of increase your skills as you develop um, uh, your usage of Spotfire. Um, and there are links to various other places on the community, such as this community um, knowledge base here that has links to lots of different videos for all different levels. And these are the same videos um, that will be presented to you um, in, the, uh, in the LinkedIn uh, community or the LinkedIn uh, group that I showed you earlier, earlier for Spotfire. So we're trying to sort of present the information to you in different ways. And uh, if you have any feedback on finding this, uh, let us know. But hopefully the changes that we're making to make this accessible to everyone are helpful to you. Um, so the other thing, because um, I've been sort of going through a number of items here on the, on the wiki. Um, when you go to this Spotify enablement hub, um, you also see a link to um, the customer success center. Um, what we have done uh, for a long time actually is the Dr. Spotfire session. So here as well, you see this webinar from today linked, um, but we also have the, the Dr. Spotfire sessions that you can join. Um, we call them the Dr. Spotfire office hours and uh, we run those frequently to do hands-on exercises on Dr. Spotfire as well. And then again, we create those videos that we share with you. The other new thing is um, the blogs. So we've started uh, producing technology blogs. We, we sort of announced this in the previous time, I believe, but um, as you can see, we've got quite a few blogs on, uh, uh, on the TIPCO community now. Um, a lot of them are uh, submitted and uh, presented by the data science team, um, but you'll see more and more blogs appear here. Um, and um, Colin is actually going to write up um, his um, uh, sort of tips and tricks on image recognition on a blog um, and publish this soon after this TIPCO Analytics meetup as well. Um, there's um, 
uh, there's a blog on the events that Michael presented at the beginning of, uh, of this uh, Tipco Analytics Meetup. So there's lots of, uh, lots of good information um, here for you to review. Um, and finally, there's uh, the ideas section as well that you can use to submit um, ideas if you want to suggest an improvement to the products that you're using. So um, I think those are the main things that I wanted to share. Um, oh yeah, the other thing, uh, just if you go back to the main page of the community, Michael mentioned this briefly already. There's a couple of big events that are coming up. Um, one of them is Tipco Now, so we've actually have that linked from uh, the main community site. Uh, so if you click on here, uh, it brings you to the, um, the main uh, Tipco Now uh, registration page. And the other one that we talked about is the analytics forum um, for, um, that's going to be held in Houston in October. So you can uh, uh, find that uh, from the community, but also directly on this website here. So those were the things I wanted to share with you today. Um, all of the links will be um, shared in, uh, uh, in the follow-up uh, PDF that we sent uh, on the community and on the meetup group as well. Um, and we wanted to finish up this session with a, a live q and I saw quite a few questions come in via the Q&A in the chat already. So um, Colin, I know you've been monitoring those. If you could uh, let us know what questions there are, we can all help to answer them. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, we've, there's some that have been answered in text, but I think it's worth just reading them out so everyone can hear. Um, the first answer, was, the first question rather, was on um, AutoML, uh, so one for Dan. It says, um, does AutoML give partial progressive results along the way, or do you have to wait until the entire computation completes before you get your results? Yep. So right now, it uh, you have to wait for the process to complete, and then you get all the results. There's, there's, uh, there's it doesn't currently uh, give you something midstream. Okay. And um, the other one was about again um, auto ML. Um, how applicable it is to all problems, um, as long as they're a classification problem in all industries. So things like fraud, credit scoring, marketing, anomaly detection, etc. Can you give a, a comment on that? Yeah, yeah. So the, the current implementation is, is classification, specifically binary classification, but the, the problems that you can apply that to could be really anything uh, as long as the target variable meets those criteria. Now, you know, we'll be looking to go beyond uh, just binary classification, uh, obviously, uh, as we progress on this. Um, and uh, um, also right now, these are really largely supervised methods that, that, that are in AutoML. So no, no unsupervised methods just yet. And that's, that's another possible avenue for the future. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there was a question on, will we, is it possible to download a copy of the slide deck and any our info from today's presentation? I think, I think you already said, Helene, that will all be published online for people. Yes, uh, they will be published on the uh, Meetup group. So um, uh, maybe, uh, well, actually the Meetup group was what uh, Michael presented in one of the first slides, and I'm, I'm not physically able to put the link in the chat now, so if somebody else can do that, it would be great. Um, but we'll also be posting them on the TIPCO community. So if you search for TIPCO Analytics Meetup, you'll find them. And there may be another email sent out as well if you registered for this. So there's, there's several ways to get to the slides and all the, the links. Um, so uh, there's a few questions on my part as well on the image recognition. So a couple of people have asked if it's going to be available to download try for themselves, um, whether the code is, is available to, to try themselves as well. Um, my intention is to get a, a, a demonstration that people can download the DXP and the TIPCO exchange, but it's not currently available. Um, I am publishing a blog on the process, hopefully tomorrow. And I want to follow that up with a wiki article. So again, it will all go on the community site and that will contain all the code with explanations that you can obviously uh, copy and paste and use yourself. Um, so hopefully we'll get that up shortly after this and we'll again, link to it in all the meetup um, pages, etc. so people can get to that. Um, there's another question around S3 buckets. So somebody's wanting to look at S3 buckets like I did. Um, yeah, I've got a script to actually list objects in S3 and download any items. Again, incredibly simple uh, to do that using Spotfire's Python data function and the Boto3 library. Um, you know, I could, I could very quickly show that if we had time, or I could just post that later yeah. as a wiki. Will I share quickly? Yeah, we've got 12 minutes, so that's, yeah, that's fine. Okay. I will 
and also just um, you know as Colin starts publishing uh, more details on the demo um, if you are using it and you have some questions for him um, the best way to get an answer is if you post a question in the answer section that I showed you on the TIPCO community and just include the link to the blog or the link to uh, to image or just mention image recognition uh, demo from the TIPCO analytics meetup and then uh, whoever sees the question first will be able to pass it on to uh, to Colin yeah, uh, to definitely. help answer yeah yeah, absolutely. Um, so let me just quickly share my screen again, um, just to show you the S3 component. Um, so hopefully you can see this. But in, So when I showed you the, the data function, I had two. There was the one to do the actual image recognition, but this was a new function I wrote uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, all it takes as a parameter is your bucket name. Um, and then you, if I show you the script, Again, very simple. You need the Boto3 pandas for data frames. Um, and what this does is you effectively, this code here connects to S3. It loops over each item. So it's just an iterator and it's got a paging function that allows you to, if you've got a very big bucket, it just pages the data. So what I do is it just checks the bucket name. And in this example, I'm actually downloading each item it finds in the bucket. So I set a download location, I check it exists, and then the actual code is really just this. Um, it's saying it just iterates the bucket items, which is my function here, and then it downloads them. So again, very simple. You can see the Boto3 here. You just tell it you're wanting to connect to S3, you give it a bucket name, and then you can download that file. Um, if you don't want to download the file and you just want to list what's in our bucket, you can do that as well. So the commented out code here, I'm just uncommenting. That was to return a list, um, so rows and a table, and it, all it did was give you a description of each um, item that was in your bucket. So you can do either or. Like I said, when you've got full access to the Boto3 um, client, you've got a massive potential to do things like this. Um, and there's lots of good guides on Amazon's own site. Uh, and as I said, hopefully I'll publish some guides myself on doing the spot far part. And you can see it's using, you know, the Python engine from Spotfire. So I'll stop sharing and pass back, but hopefully that gives a little bit more detail. Great, thanks. So I think, um, I think that's most of the questions done. Wonderful. Okay, well, thanks everyone for, um adding the questions and uh, for participating today. Um, you will be receiving the links to the, uh, to the videos and the deck and uh, we'll um, organize another TIPCO Analytics Meetup probably in two to three months. So uh, this will be um, linked to the content that we'll be presenting at TIPCO now in London as well. So hopefully we'll meet some of you there in person um, and otherwise we'll see you in the next virtual TIPCO Analytics Meetup. Thanks Colin, thanks Dan, thanks Michael for presenting and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.